I mentioned to you on Monday a little bit of the background of this course. And I mentioned that it came about as a kind of focus group in collaboration with Professor Jim Clowes, who really was the vision, or in collaboration with the students, was the vision for the development of a kind of innovative approach to critical thinking. And how since then it's tied into so many different things, to study abroad, as a, a way for us to really engage in the study of culture and different worldviews, of revisioning the university, completely rethinking what is its historical background, what is its objective and focus in the contemporary world, how can we modify it in relation to the broader community, and methods of learning. So in lots of ways, Jim Clowes has been really instrumental in pushing the boundaries of all of these topics and considering in a creative way how all of us equally collaboratively can participate in revisioning the university and its role. And I, we thought it would be useful if he could come in and visit with us just briefly to discuss his vision. I mentioned that he was originally scheduled to teach this course and uh, maybe respond to some of your questions or comments, but generally just to give you a sense of his vision for the university, how it came out of the CHID program, how it came out of this course. So Jim is with us here today, and you could join us and talk about these things. So Jim Klaus. with any luck. <laughs> so I thought it was rather ironic that we start with, with Neil right before or right after he sort of plummets out throughout the known matrix, able to master it with a single leap. And uh, you get the feeling like if you take this course, you'll, ma you'll master the matrix, right? That's true. <laughs> and, <laughs> And of course, that's true. Can, can people in the back hear me? Amazing. Wow. Uh, and the, I just wanted to say a tiny bit about that. Is uh, obviously we're not suggesting that anything even close to that. But what we are suggesting is we live our, our lives, our, our worlds, within frames of a series of overlapping matrices different ways of seeing that govern how we can see the world. Does that make sense? So the structured pattern of how we think, we live within that frame. And it allows us to make these wonderful discoveries about life and about the world and about things around us. But it also freezes us with the uncertain patterns of thought that don't allow us to think outside those either. And so that is the blessing and curse of being a human, perhaps, is we have these amazing tools of reflection and knowledge that pinion us, that freeze us with uncertain ways of knowing. And the upshot of that, the real danger of that, is that it leads to an unending series of wars, to be honest, the record of human history, because we simply cannot see the other in any other way than the other. And we end up ultimately describing them as evil or as the they that need to be destroyed. So our hope, my hope, is that we see our effort in learning to both expand the understanding of the matrices that we live in, not to pretend like they don't exist, not to pretend that we can do without them somehow, but to expand our ability to move into them 
humbly and to move back out of them and to use the different ways of seeing them. This is a core notion for this class. We sat around together, this group of about, I'm sorry for my voice, man. I normally I have this great voice normally. <laughs> it's sexier this way. It's, 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 <laughs> yeah, it, I don't know about that. I thought my last voice was sexy, Doug's. By the way, Jim has always done his, uh, his featured lecture on um, sex, right? History of sex. Yeah. So, so we're, we're looking forward to that one as well with your theme song, I'm Too Sexy. <laughs> so uh, with any luck, inshallah, we'll be able to give that lecture. Uh, I really want to because it's a funny lecture. And it's kind of fun too. Uh, but it's not slated for another month and a half or so. At any rate, so there's this group of us students years ago, 10 years ago, I call myself a student, it's so funny. Because <laughs> I was just sitting around asking the question, what is it that, need, that the university needs more than anything? How, how can we, these sort of few people, nothing special, what can we offer that would be of use? And we came up with a design, the rough design of this course, and it is, we need to find something that pretty much everybody agrees in. And then the phrase, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. We thought, generally, most people would adhere to. And we needed to take that phrase and do an historic overview of it. Well, how did that phrase come to be? And how was it enshrined in American political consciousness? How was it framed in American political consciousness? And so the whole course, in essence, is exactly that. It's a study of a way of thinking. It's a study of an idea. Hence, the comparative history of ideas and the question of human nature. Because that phrase, we hold these truths to be self-evident, makes it clear that the writers of that thought there could be no other way. So the group of us sitting around said, yes, let's start there. And let's make the course not only sort of um, an historical reflection of that concept, but a reflection of each person's response to the way it's being taught, the things that we're reading, the individual responses of the class to that idea. Because as you'll find out, one of the key things in all Alt-Jid stuff is this idea of the reflexivity of thought. That whenever we read, we're inclined to write either bullshit in the margins or yay in the margins, right? Well, I'm from eastern Montana. You, you say bullshit in eastern Montana. I, I don't know what you say. <laughs> but you either go, this is so much bullshit, or this is amazing. So we tend to look at the world through those lenses that we come to the world with. And so you can't really have a class that, that carefully investigates something unless you incorporate your own individual response to that effort. So it becomes a dialectic then, moving back and forth between the best we can offer and how these ideas came about. Why Thomas Jefferson could write with such confidence we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So the class becomes a dialectic between that and the way we respond. And then it moves historically. Why is it that a bunch of slave owners could write that and not feel conflicted? How is that possible? 
And how is it possible also that the Native American populations weren't included at all in that statement, nor women? And yet, and yet the writers didn't see a contradiction. Now it's easy to see those contradictions. And we go back and say, are these all idiots? Right? But at the time, I mean, that should be the dead giveaway, the first evidence that we're in different worlds when something seems so evident to us and is not evident to other people. Let me tie this in with a couple other things. This principle of trying to find a point of view that allows us to see, how shall I say it, that certain things might seem self-evident and are not, is a, behind the whole idea of all the international movement and travel that Chit has offered in the past. For instance, when you go to Belfast, and you stand in Belfast, or you walk across the city. Actually, Theron just came there from yesterday, right? Day before. Day before yesterday. And you see the colors of the Union Jack, the British colors painted on the curbstones, and one street over the colors of Sinn Féin painted on, on the other curbstones. And you see this, this hatred, this historical hatred that has, on some levels, become physical and it becomes so self-evident you go why can't you see that you're injuring both of your causes by this type of hatred and what that tells us is two things one we really don't understand what's going on and two when you're in the midst of something you really don't understand what's going on so going back to the class and the role of class in our lives and in the pursuit of knowledge, that's the same exact function. And what I mean by that is, how can we create patterns of thought that allow us to see our own blockages, to see our own limitations our own matrices, our own matrixes, if you will. If we're in the midst of the matrix, how can we learn to see it? That is the absolute most difficult thing of all. And I believe there are certain habits of mind and practice that allow that to happen. I believe study, critical inquiry and study, especially if it's active. If you come to class with a goal of trying to engage in active critical dialogue that's open and not just wanting to lacerate your opponent, but actually open where you can listen and respond, that will begin to reveal some of those blockages. Studying and reading things you wouldn't normally study does that. Travel does that. And service does that. And by service, I mean engagement in the community, working with people in a way that's not just purely for your own personal gain, but out working with, with the world outside you in a way that you have to cooperate. So those begin slowly to outline the fabric or the intentionality behind what Chid wants to accomplish. We're trying to find a way to create habits of mind that allow us, this is gonna sound hokey, but uh, well, damn the torpedoes, I guess, that we learn enough humility that we can learn how to ask the right questions. That's really my goal, this whole thing. If we can learn enough humility that says, I don't have enough answers. I don't really know 
all that is needed to be known. I don't really understand that then makes space for new answers, new questions, new ways of response. And beautifully, and here's why I think it's beautiful, beautifully it makes sense for you to be able to rest and accept yourself, your own patterns of thought, the things that you live with, your habits of holidays, the simple little things that make you happy. Let me give you one example. I'm going to stand up just because I'm tired of being sick. But uh, I grew up on a little ranch. Well, if you're from eastern Montana, it's not a ranch because it only had 150 cows. And the breaking line was like over 200 or something. So that, it was a farm. You know? <laughs> but, and, and I grew up on this little ranch. Well, I'm in Seattle now, and they don't have that division. And I'm, I'm closing up now, Doug. So no, just, not a problem. Just take as long as you'd like. That, see you, John. Oh, sorry. I think I caught him on his way out. That, uh, and I liked it. I liked my life. You know, we grew up. And this little tiny is a really poor, obviously, frame of reference. And uh, I didn't know that, uh, and we're very much carnivores. We used to watch uh, late night television with steaks, you know, just as, as a snack food. It was what we did. But, but I, then when I got to Missoula, Montana, where I did my, so everything that I thought was Good. Oh, that's much better. There we go. Uh, thank you. Now I feel in the light. <laughs> but uh, I, I felt like um, uh, that somehow I was wrong because I had this moral, uh, cultural pattern of, of killing animals, using animals, right? A lot of rodeo type stuff. And uh, um, and I was in a circle of people, one of them were radical animal rights activists. And I'm all for that, by the way. I think there needs to be a rethinking of these things. But I was really seriously whipping myself for having this wrong attitude. And it finally took me to this place of humility that I'm talking about, where it was acceptable for me to accept my own parts of my own past. And that's what I mean, ultimately, by habit patterns of mind and habits of thinking that can lead to humility, that allow us to ask questions, allow us to let people be who they are, and allow us to let ourselves be who we are, but always, always within this pattern of dialogue. Now I realize it's becoming very vague and opaque at this point. And I want to try to wrap up in something very concrete, which in Chid you almost never get. <laughs> <laughs> but this course, Chid 110, is, is I believe, sort of a, a reflection of what I would love to see throughout the university. And that is a blending of critical thinking a blending of self-reflection involved in critical thinking, and also a strong call to activism within critical thinking. And by activism, I don't mean specific political action of one type. I mean taking your dreams, your visions, your notions about what life should be, and beginning to act on those, to live out your life in a way that's honest and reflective of those deeper issues. So in the end, uh, so I don't take more time, because this is a very dense class. And you're going to be responsible for the things you're not getting because I'm speaking. <laughs> I want to conclude and wish to you a marvelous class. And I wish to myself enough health that I can come back. Um, 
a couple times maybe in the course of this quarter and speak to you. There's a couple, couple lectures that I'd really dearly like to live. So, the, so to, to give. <laughs> now there's a Freudian. That's a Freudian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, both. They kind of they kind of coincide on this particular issue. <laughs> so just to conclude, um, this course wants to start you with a deep investigation of the history of that idea, namely that all men are created equal, and then how it becomes enshrined in American political consciousness in certain ways, and who is excluded in American political history from that definition, and how that definition morphs through the years. And then ultimately, take one particular case study of Native American and study the, the culture clashes between Europe and Native Americans, just to see, look at it more intensely. And then towards the end, we have this great science fiction for you to read. And the purpose of that is to demonstrate that these issues don't simply, they aren't simply part of the past, but they're part of the fabric of maybe what it means to be you. And lastly, there, I have this book it's just put on the reading list for this year, written by a Lebanese novelist. Absolutely marvelous book. It's called uh, In the Name of Identity, the, the uh, Search for the Roots of Violence, I believe. I can't remember. If it's, is that right? Something close to that. And I love the book because it outlines that we are all multiple identities, not just singular identities that every one of us in this room are made up of any number, a widespread, huge number of shifting identities, and that we can choose to align or see through the eyes of other people by seeing those points of identity that we share in common. To me, it's a message of hope. And it's a message that we desperately need right now in this point in history. So with that, I'm going to head off. Good luck with this rest of this class.